button. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to Conversations That Matter. Uh, Conversations That Matter is a show where we um, talk about, we have real conversations about the issues of race, diversity, inclusion, and social justice. Um, today, we'd like to welcome our panel and our, our discussion today, we'll, we will be talking about the reopening. And I'd like to welcome you all. I see a lot of familiar faces today. And we have a, a very um, lively panel here today, and we're going to discuss um, the very ever-changing news cycle that's been going on surrounding the, the, the reopening that we're going through right now. So we have members of um, the business community, as well as um, the community at large, and um, people that will speak to some of the experiences that they have been having um, during the pandemic and uh, now that we are preparing for the reopening. And we will allow you, our viewing audience, to um, chime in at some point and just give us your um, you know, perspective and what you're going through and what you see and um, how you're uh, once again pivoting with all that's going on. So first, I'd like to welcome our first guest, um, Katie Ickeson, and she is the executive director with the uh, Mashpee Chamber of Commerce, the newly appointed executive director, I'd like to say. Um, I've known Katie for um, quite a bit of time, yes. And she has been um, working with uh, Mary Lou Palumbo there for quite a bit of time and um, working really hard. So she um, is newly appointed and, and, and just earned that seat and we are so proud of you Katie and know that you will do a good job so um, I'd like to just get your perspective on um, let me see I want to know from the chamber standpoint like what have you um, been doing during this last the last 16 months or so as a chamber member in supporting um, all the businesses that you support on Cape Cod I know that people had um, many challenges. They had to apply for PPE loans. Um, they had to, basically they went into survival mode. Um, the, the economy started to slow. Some businesses um, were even lost. I see new businesses coming into Mashpee Commons. Some of the businesses have, have closed. Um, and uh, I just wanna know as a, as a chamber, what was your response to um, the businesses that you support? Thank you, Marie. Um, yeah, the Chamber of Commerce in Mashpee, we serve mostly Mashpee-based businesses, but our membership expands across Cape Cod, South Shore. We have a member from Rhode Island, so we're, we're quite expansive in that regard. Um, and what I found myself doing when I got sent home from my office on St. Patrick's Day of 2020 um, was just like all of the other businesses panicking, right? Um, we, we are a small business. We operate like a small business. We're not, not for profit, which is one of the only differences, but we're serving our not for profits as well for our membership. Um, so like a lot of people, um, in business, but also just on a personal level, we got sent to our rooms, right? So there's definitely, there was a period of, of misunderstanding, confusion, and grief, right? Which is a very big, complicated kind of package to take home with you um, from restaurants, performers, retail shops, everything that was shut down. And the folks that were still going to work were similarly put into this position of, new guidelines, new rules, lots of things to misinterpret and misunderstand. Um, and this is across the entire globe, right? That this was impacted. So at least we had that universal experience of not knowing. Um, as far as how things progressed, um, my job became very much um, a communication bridge, right? So. Um, I would read, I would study, I would watch, I would listen to all of the guidelines, especially those presented uh, by our Commonwealth government, but also by our town governments. Mm -hmm. 
and I would translate that as best as I possibly could for our membership. And so it was a matter of answering one-on-one -on -one questions, um, but also communicating, you know, every week we send out an email newsletter to our membership and to some of the public. And so the messaging had to be clear and concise. Uh, we worked with organizations that are members like Take Care Cape Cod on their friendly cartoon approachable messaging about being nice to each other and asking up and giving people space. Um, we worked with organizations like SCORE um, and with the Massachusetts Small Development um, Department on legal issues, on issues of understanding how to use new medium. We expanded our social media presence just like everyone else. So my role became quite a parallel to a lot of the businesses on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, a lot of our what we're starting to go back into, which I'm sure we'll discuss more, our events and our regular projects were just stopped, right? So my focus solely became on messaging to our membership. And then I got a lot of phone calls from people from other states asking what the guidelines were for travel. And that became a really big part of my role, especially in the summertime of last year. Um, you mentioned the loan system from the Small Business Administration, the SBA loans, the PPP loans. I am not a financial expert. I have an English degree. <laughs> and so my job, again, became bridging the gap for our small business members by connecting them with a name at an organization or institution that could help them. So specifically suggesting they go talk to this person at this bank, right? Mm -hmm. um, and having those relationships, I was able to recommend on, you know, a person. Um, and so I became a, a person bridge as well, connecting people to other people, which became um, really valuable. And I think the thing that most people got out of the Chamber of Commerce last year, at least in Mashpee, was that a person was still answering the phone. I made sure to answer every phone call mm -hmm. and that was a full-time job in and of itself. So, sure. um, you know, and do you been, work alone, Katie? I do currently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Lou Palumbo retired in December of 2020 um, and our other employee um, took a leave of absence and is looking for other work at the moment because um, the kind of work she was doing doesn't suit her here quite as well. So I am a one woman band. Um, however, I have an incredible, incredible support system here in town. So um, it is really, really easy for me to ask for help and get help when I need it. So mm -hmm. I'm really grateful for the Mashpee community. Shout out to all of my board members for stepping up when I ask them to. So. Awesome, because I know that um, it it sounds like you're going to be even busier with um, the opening where people are going to be traveling more and traveling um, to the Cape because it is um, still has that local kind of feel instead of, you know, people traveling abroad and other places. Absolutely. So they're going to be seeking answers and you're still going to be that bridge um, you know, so I'd, I'd like to come back to you. Um, we're going to talk more about your events that you have opening and how you're going to deal with um, those issues and some of the other things that you've been doing um, while you have been closed. Um, our next guest, I want to bring on, um, let's see, I want to bring on Ralph Jason Younger. And Ralph is um, the Assistant General Manager of uh, Bad Mother. Uh, East Falmouth, Bad Mouth of Beer. He's also the owner of um, Simply Black and White Catering, and he is a blogger. He has a blog called My Daddy Wears an Apron, and he is also my son. So welcome, Ralph, and I'm, I'm so glad to have you, and he also is one of the sponsors on this show, and we've been trying to get him on for a bit. So I'm glad you're here today, and I know um, that you have uh, a lot to to add to this conversation in terms of um, the business community um, where you're planning to open fully on, on Saturday. So what I wanna hear from you um, is your experience during the last 16 months, um, both, both personally and professionally um, in, in all your, your hats, um, if, you, you know, if you will uh, combine them a little and talk about some of the challenges that you had in closing down 
and um, in, in opening back up and how it affected um, your bottom lines. And, and we use that word pivot a lot. And I know you did a lot of pivoting during this time in, in bringing your um, personal business online a lot with, with events um, that you've done. So I just like you to talk to our viewing audience about uh, your experiences. Thank you. Sure, sure. Well, thank you, um, Mom, Marie, for having me on and good afternoon, everyone. And um, like Katie touched upon back in February, 2020, um, actually the 17th, it was right after we were getting ready to celebrate St. Patrick's Day when we got the, the uh, word that the pandemic had reached a higher level and all businesses were to shut down. And um, I remember, I'm also, I'm the assistant general manager at Bad Martha's Farmers Brewery here in East Falmouth. Um, and like she said, I wear multiple different other hats in different businesses, but I'm gonna pretty much touch on Bad Martha because um, it's a very local and uh, prominent here and I can share a lot of the challenges. Um, so on February 17th, we got the call that we were to shut down, but the weekend before we hosted one of our largest events um, just celebrating St. Patrick's Day um, and tons and tons of people. But I remember the momentum of ourselves of the news, you know, there was just the unknown, you know, there was this, this, this pandemic happening, uh, clean, clean, clean. I remember just Lysol and gloves and hand sanitizer to the point your hands are just dry and, and numb because you just, you know, everybody was just, it was so unknown. So then we get uh, the call. So we shut down and you're kind of just left in limbo, you know, from, from an employee standpoint, you know, um, you didn't know, you know, the only advice we got was to apply for unemployment and do it quickly, because obviously there would have been a big onslaught of people trying to get on unemployment and the backlog that happened. Um, so I was, you know, lucky to be able to do that quickly. And I didn't really miss a beat. But, um, you know, a lot of people still struggle. Some people are still waiting for back pay for unemployment from that time. So um, it was it was a difficult time. And um, and then when the PPP information came out and businesses were able to apply for that and had to bring workers back to work, um, you know, it was advantageous from a business standpoint for that to happen. But from an employee standpoint, it was still the unknowns. We just, you know, there wasn't enough information about, you know, were we going to be safe? You know, we're going back into this restaurant setting and doing this takeout and, you know, engaging with customers. But, um, you know, and I understand from the business standpoint, they were able to, you know, get some loans at no interest or, you know, they would be forgiven over time. But it really doesn't trickle down to the fact that as an employee, your health and your, your welfare would be taken care of as well. So um, I was very reluctant, you know, I'm just being honest and transparent. I was very reluctant and I was the last person to sign on to join back, but um, you know the incentive was they gave you a little extra in your pay to come back, and you know, and for me, what I do for Bad Martha is their social media um, events, um, branding, sales development, things like that. So a lot of it I could do from home. Um, so I was able to. different resources with uh, Google, and Google Meets and things like that. So I was able to do all my work from home. Um, so that was okay for me. Um, and then, you know, fast forward, June 8th came, and that's when we could reopen and welcome guests back in. And again, um, that was a traumatic time, just to just the anticipation, because you don't know how the guests are ready to react to coming out. You're, you're, you're spending thousands of dollars for the business to create these and I call them inside, outside, outside. You know, people want to be outside, but they want all the elements of inside. And it's so challenging because, you know, they'll come up to the door and they'll say, I want to be outside, but I need to be warm. I need to be this. And it's like, well, it's the same temperature as outside. It's outside, you know. So <laughs> to, uh, chuckle a little bit and find some humor in it. Um, but, you know, so you created all these spaces and, you know, you got into a good rhythm. And now here we come with a new rhythm, you know, the, the just the free, you know, back to normal as, as those 15 months 
didn't even happen more or less. And for, for businesses and for hospitality management, you know, we don't get real incentives or bonuses or anything during this time. We just had to kind of pivot through, balance the energy of our staff and different things that are going on. And, um, and now we're, you know, less than 30 days to now create a new normal, you know, a new normal that is uh, conducive to the world who's so ready to have their mask up, but a staff that's tired, a staff that's still uncertain, a staff that's still just, you know, was able to get vaccinated. So we're still trying to play catch up. So there's a lot of challenges that come along with that. And then, you know, you're trying to use the outdoor spaces that you've created. And then there's you know, limitations on that. And that's looming in the back of your mind that this could all go away August 15th because Governor Baker had uh, said that we no longer in a state of emergency. So all the safeguards that we have are supposed to expire on August 15th. And for Cape Cod, that's the height of our summer season, you know? So um, it's just challenging. I can say that it's just been a challenging um uh, time, you know, but for hospitality is all I know. I'm, you know, self-proclaimed hospitality guru and my other businesses with Simply Black and White um, catering and events and hospitality management. I just took that offline in terms of doing um, in person events or anything like that. And I pivoted and created um, online events and did birthday parties and Zoom different uh, outings and different things like that. So that was such a great a uh, reward for me to be able to just work from home with this one computer and a ring light and and create so much different opportunities and still give that hospitality during this time for people who's, you know, celebrated their milestone 80th birthdays and, you know, different other things. So that was wonderful. And then as one of the sponsors here at Kennedy Donovan Center, I also work for them as well. And through my, my daddy wears an apron, which is a blog and lifestyle uh, journey of my children and myself, uh, being a stay-at-home dad when they were born, uh, now nine and 10 years ago, and pivoting the catering company and building that and, you know, all the challenges of being a dad and um, everything. I blogged my whole experience on Facebook and Instagram and with KDC, um, I do cooking classes. So I created the My Daddy Wears an Apron cooking series and we were meeting weekly and now we're bi-weekly and then we went to monthly as the world reopens. Um, and it's been such a rewarding experience for myself um, because I get to connect with a, a group of people that are just so loving and genuine and very appreciative. Um, so it's just been, you know, just a lot of pivoting, a lot of challenges, but, um, like your title says, we're going to make it after all. So uh, we'll, we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing, um, Ralph. There's so much in there. I got, I, I, I got stopped on when he said I was one of the last people to go back. And I just wanted to um, ask um, if you can, you know, remember, Ralph, for me to ask you why. What were your concerns? I know that... Um, you know, black people, people of color were disproportionately affected um, by the pandemic and from a health standpoint. You know, we were dying at a rate of, of three to one. Um, and that was concerning to me just in the hearing. You know, I reacted just to the hearing of that in terms of how I protected my family, right? How I, I made sure that we, we were safe. Um, and also, um, you know, the low wage earner who was out there, the, the, the clerk at the supermarket, um, the, the, you know, the waitress who, who worked throughout the pandemic when things were opening. So, you know, the cries of, of, of lazy people um, who don't want to come back to work um, that we hear all over you know, the airways all over social media, the, you know, in our communities, um, the issues are so much more complex than just people not wanting to return to work. It's just not that simple. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce our next um, panelist, 
Jessica Ellis Wilson. I always love to have her voice um, added to the conversation. She is the founder and the principal um, practical in principle, uh, practical management and leadership um, consulting. So I'd like to bring her on and just get a little perspective on um, where we stand. What I see um, just, you know, perusing all the outlets, listening to the media, is that we are as um, divided as um, we always have been on this issue. I think um, politically um, where people lie, there's a lot to that division. So Jessica, are you still? I am, I'm here. Okay. All right, I'm here. here. So yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot. And you know, just to speak to something that you said, Maureen, it kind of touches on what Ross was talking about too, that you know, marginalized people, particularly black Americans were dying at a much higher rate from the pandemic. And that's not because there is something about SARS COVID to that is more endemic to black people. It's because a pandemic like this amplifies every disparity in the healthcare system. So marginalized folks who are more likely to work service industry jobs, who are more likely to work low wage jobs with poor health insurance, little time off, little protection, they're gonna get sicker faster because they're not able to stay and work at home right? They're not able to um, take a leave of absence or, you know, decamp to the country where there's less people, right? You, if you work in a bodega, you got to, you know, stay in the neighborhood and, and work at the bodega. And showing my time in New York, if I call it, right, we don't call it bodega in Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, we do. <laughs> but, you know, there, so we, it, it amplified the problems that we already know exist in healthcare. And we're see, we saw it with the vaccine rollout as well. The, the, neighbor, the neighborhoods and areas that were most hardest hit and had the highest transmission rates were not the areas that got the vaccine roll, rolled out initially. Um, and that speaks to infrastructure, it speaks to you know, institutionalized bias and racism and and a whole lot of problems that we've been talking about it, I feel like for 20 years um, but particularly for the last you know year and a half and when we when we talk about people not wanting to come back to work well if you have a service industry job or a hospitality industry job you know you were a, a chambermaid at one of the one of the Cape hotels that shut down in the winter anyway so you're in a, the middle of a season you're gearing up to start work and suddenly they say, don't come, you know, and, and then you have nothing because you didn't start work. So you can't claim unemployment to begin with. It's, it's tough, you know, all of the performers, the artists, the musicians, you know, in addition to my consulting work, I run a theater company. You know, we had closed a production four days before the state shut down. And, you know, just sneaked in, you know, sort of under the wire. But I had, you know, a lot of people who rely on, you know, thankfully no full-time employees, but a lot of people who rely on that income that they, they get for doing productions with us that I had to say, I have no work. We have, you know, and trying to pivot and teach some classes online and, and all of that. But, you know, we've had a lot of people who historically don't get benefits, don't get health insurance, don't get a lot of help, and they're the most, um, the most affected when something like this happens. The, the high wage white collar workers who can go and work from their home office and do Zoom conferences, they're, they weren't affected as much. You know, we all had this sort of period of grief and trauma, but we went from essential workers being heroes to essential workers shouldn't be in, in priority for the vaccine to essential workers are ungrateful because they're not coming back to work at these, these less than living wages with low benefits and no job security. And it, my stance has always been as a leadership consultant, if you're not paying, if your business model relies on um, exploitation wages, then you do not have a sustainable business model. Mm -hmm. If you don't treat your employees right, then you are always going to have high turnover. You're always going to have poor customer service. You're always going to, because why, why is anybody going to go above and beyond if they know that 
you, they're not going to be treated right. So it's a, it's a whole, there's a whole lot of stuff that has been wrong in America for a very long time that the last, um, the last 16 or 17 months have really sort of kind of, you know, somebody flipped the table and everything's still up in the air and we're still trying to find out where it lands. But I wish I had good answers for any of them other than, you know, people need to start remembering that there are other there are other humans on the other side of those interactions that they're having with people. And, you know, I'm watching flight attendants get punched, their teeth get punched out because they tell someone don't stand up when the, when the plane is taxiing. And, you know, a, a security guard at a dollar general in, in Minnesota got shot in the head for telling someone to put a mask on. Uh, you know, how can we ask our employees to be that, person at the door and put their lives at risk when when people are so irrational about things i i wish i i wish i could run i could say i i, I have a magic solution and, and wave my wand and it would be fixed but it, it's just a lot of to use a phrase katie used um it's going to be a lot of bridge building and and bridge building between people and really getting that sense of community back because that's what we've lost and when you have a community, you take care of each other. Mm -hmm. And when you have individuals, you have individuals. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. You see why I have her on? She's great. Yeah, you know, um, we, we've gone from having great empathy for one another, you know, when we were in need of that toilet paper and um, the food lines on Cape Cod were wrapped around the blocks. Yeah. You know, I, um, I, I, I received a flyer once and it said, you know, free cheese or milk or something. And I, I went just really not, um, and I mean this with all sincerity, just thinking, you know, it said free to everyone. So I went and I'm sitting um, at, in my backyard at my drum circle this summer, telling the story of how I went to get the, whatever they were giving out and how the line was wrapped down the highway with police details and, and regular, our neighbors, nice cars, everybody, you know, going to get this food. And the person I was telling the story to was, got a little emotional and said, yes, my wife was in that line. They had to be there. They were both laid off. They're both professionals and were laid off at that time. And, and it hit me that, um, you know, they they needed to be there and these are our neighbors that that work and and raise children and own homes in this community and we've gone from having great empathy for one another during the last 16 months to shouting lazy americans lazy neighbors get back to work you don't want to work and i always wonder how do we get there how do, how do we get there? How do we forget the fear that we've had, that we've experienced, that we didn't know whether we were gonna live or die? How do we go from there to let's open everything up and just jump on in and have a margarita, you know? Because we missed it, you know? Um, there's, there's a, like Jessica said, there's a bridge in between that. There's a, there's, there's some steps that we need to take and some care that we need to take of one another and an understanding that we all don't come from the same place, right? That we all have different um, circumstances that we, and different challenges that we come from that we need to, um, you know, have an understanding about. So with that, I'm gonna bring on my next guest. Her name is Carrie Parcell, and um, and she is a regional solid waste and recycling expert for Cape Cod and the islands. She's also an adjunct professor with um, the uh, Mass Maritime Academy, and uh, you know she just has a, a, a myriad of hats that she wears. But I'm, I'm bringing her on as the co-owner of Refashion Chatham. It's a consignment shop. And I'm just happy to have her on just to lend some perspective on 
where she is as a business and um, what are some of the things that um, she's doing. I, I, I ran into her on social media because I noticed that she was um, alerting her customers that um, you will be continuing to wear masks um, at her store and continuing to practice some of the, the protocols. So that, that was interesting to me and I asked her to join us. And I just want you to just give us some of your um, challenges. You're, you're a new business, correct? Uh, we yeah. are. We opened on May 1st. So I have a very different story uh, yes. than what we've been hearing. And, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful that you invited me um, despite like the last minute. So I actually logged on to our meet and greet a little bit late because I was on a work call. No and worries. then I had to sort of change into I am no longer the solid waste and recycling expert. I am now, you know, refashion Chatham. Um, yes. So um, I, I really enjoy that um, I've heard these stories and I'm actually happy that I was able to hear Ralph and Katie and Jessica speak before myself. Yes. Um, so like you said, my background is I've never worked retail. So to own a retail shop is very interesting. Um, it came about as a conversation um, I would say during the COVID summer. So, you know, sometime between June, July, August of 2020. Um, so my position, I, I was lucky enough with my position that we just trans, we, we just became remote workers. I was already a field worker with my full-time job. Um, it was a little shocking to the students at Mass Maritime to go from me being in the classroom with them to them all of a sudden having to do, you know, these Zoom lessons and, you know, they, they, you know, they were paying a full tuition and they wanted to be with their friends. And so there was a lot of trial and tribulation as far as like being their professor and giving them, you know, sort of a little bit of peace of mind that we're sort of all in this together. And we might, you know, we might be, you know, in the same water, but we're all on a different boat, depending on what's going on in our personal lives, because sometimes school or other things can be an escape. And I felt like, you know, sometimes for these students to have to transfer back home or to wherever they were staying or living was a really difficult thing for some of them. And some of them were in a very warm environment where they were glad to be home. Um, for myself with my job with the state and the county, again, I just, I'm right here in my little enclave. Um, so I've been working from home since February of 2019. Um, so um, my, you know, my transition went from being out in the field and traveling the Cape and going to the islands and just really appreciating the beauty of the ecology that I work with and, uh, you know, being an environmental specialist and, and really looking at the social aspect of trash and recycling to sort of sitting at home at a computer all day, which I never, I've never done. Um, and it's been the busiest year of my entire career, ironically, um, in 2020. And so, you know, going as a co-owner to refashion was, um, you know, it was a beautiful summer day. I sort of, my, my day job sort of slows down in the summer, obviously I'm not teaching in the summer. Um, so I was out on the deck, I was getting some sun and a girlfriend of mine was like, she's been in retail her entire life, mentioned that um, the place that she was working for was probably gonna close and she wanted to like, you know, own her own place. And, you know, I could kind of tell that there was a little trepidation on her part about um, doing it on her own. Um, and I was like, I'll do it with you. Like it just came out of my mouth. And lo and behold, uh, the store closed. Um, I contacted the landlord. Like, so she's like the fun fashion side and mm -hmm. I'm the business side. Like I have a master's degree in public administration and that's what I do. I network and I, I know how to write a business proposal. I know how to like get a DBA. I know how to like contact payroll and all this other stuff. So I did the not sexy stuff. She did all the fun stuff. We definitely have a vision of what our shop was going to look like and what we wanted to do and be. And I definitely, you know, inserted my background on sustainability and reuse and reduction. Um, you know, how, you know, I mean, reuse clothing is, is my jam, you know, like I, I'm all about reuse. So, um, uh, in February, um, I contacted the landlords and they wrote out a business proposal. Um, I, um, you know, they, I negotiated the rent. So I took an opportunity to say, look, we're in COVID times. I'm not going to pay the listed rent. I'm going to, I'm comfortable with this. 
and mm -hmm. let's check in with each other in a year. Um, and so the lease stipulates that. So we used it as an opportunity. We opened up May 1st and, um, you know, we have been more than blessed by our community um, in the town of Chatham and, and other, you know, people via social media. Um, and when we found out about this new reopening, this lift of you know, as somebody said, I think it was Jessica, like we went from like being fear based to <laughs> take off the mask. It's fine now. And, you know, I'm going to be 40 next year. My co-owner is going to be 33. And we, you know, we just decided like as a business, as a small business, I mean, our space is probably 650 square feet. We just decided that the protocols that are in place are going to continue to be, you know, to be implemented for an undetermined amount of time. So the plexiglass will stay up. Um, we are going to request in a, in the kindest manner possible that you, in the store, you know, while you're shopping, please wear a mask. And we are going to supply masks for people who have decided they're tired of them. We're not carrying them around anymore. We're not doing anything. And you know, the, I think the only hard part will be like that undetermined amount of time, like how long do we continue and mm -hmm. how, like, are we really, you know, will there be customers in a cute little shop that's painted pink, you know, will they get belligerent with us? And at what point do we take that position as business owners to say, you know, maybe shopping here isn't, isn't for you, um, mm -hmm. but I appreciate your interest in our shop and we're asking you to leave. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think you know, we didn't have the like, scare, like I personally didn't have a scare. Um, my co-owner did because she was working in retail and retail shops closed. They couldn't try things on. You couldn't go inside. Da, 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 da. So she had that battle. Um, the one fear that we have now is we are actually doing so well um, mm -hmm. in our first, you know, 26 days of business that we are looking to hire. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to pay uh, at minimum $17 an hour but we are not hiring a full-time person. So mm -hmm. we need somebody maybe one day a week and maybe somebody who can fill in. I work seven days a week, um, you know, teaching, um, being a board member um, at the Upper Cape Tech High School and for Care for Cape and the Islands with the Take Care campaign. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm always like trying to go from meeting to meeting to be like, who am I right now? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, for my own sanity, and I think for the the mental health of my partner, who's not used to that experience of being there, you know, all of the time mm -hmm. um, and having to be that reliable person for a business seven days a week, we need somebody that can kind of allow us to have a little bit of that personal reprieve. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where our challenge, I think, is going to lie, because, again, somebody mentioned that she's coming in right now, actually, uh, <laughs> Miss Miss Stylish, Miss Instagram. Oh wow! Um, and that. so, okay. what we need for our personal lives and to give ourselves a break is to have somebody come in. But our challenge is: Will somebody come in? Mm -hmm. Will somebody work for seventeen dollars an hour and and maybe know it's a Monday, but mm -hmm. maybe not know that we might call them in on maybe every random Sunday or maybe a Saturday where one of us just needs to go to the beach or take a mental health day or give ourselves permission to not have to be super concerned all the time about, you know, the business. And I'm actually going to let Jesse talk about that a little bit because her perspective on that is a little bit different. If we have time, I don't want to take up, you know, questions or anything. Yeah. Can we see that outfit, Jesse? Oh my gosh, look how gorgeous she is. I don't know. Yeah. That's so, so like cute. she's wearing like a <laughs> Nike tracksuit. <laughs> that is too cute. Yeah. So I went on your on your page and on your site, and your store is gorgeous. Thank and your you. clothes are, are beautiful. And um, so I give you guys kudos as a as a woman who runs a organization that um, lifts up women. Um, you're, that you're doing a beautiful job. I really um, think you're doing good. Maybe if you lift that 17 to 20, you may get all those things that you're looking for. <laughs> Just a thought. Right, but, um, right, yeah. right. Just a thought, since they're only coming in one day, you know? Um, yeah, no, I've that's also, a good idea. Yeah, I've also supported a woman in Mashpee who had a consignment shop. Um, you know, but I think that um, your your product is 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 just beautiful. Thank you so much. It really is, and um, and and look to getting some plus size things as well. Oh, we uh, definitely have some. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
But I, I, I think it's, I'm glad that you guys are making a stand on what you want to do because it is going to be um, the choice of the business owner to be able to um, make the determination on the way in which they want to run their stores. Um, I had a, a conversation with a police officer and we talked about liberty. Everyone's throwing that word around their freedoms and their liberty is being infringed upon. And, and you know, that word liberty, you know, the freedom to do as you will until it infringes on another person's right to do as they will and to, to be able to live free and, and free from harm and danger, yeah. right? So when you're saying, I don't want to wear a mask and you're putting someone else in danger. So the police are there to um, enforce um, your rights to be able to do what you will in your store. So he was giving me an example as to when um, he was called to a store and the person was being belligerent and they were like, tell them that I don't have to wear a mask because the CDC came out with that confusing you know, everyone who's vaccinated does no longer has to wear a mask and they can go in, except where it infringes on the, the business's right to say, no, yeah. not here. So the police officer says, yeah, if you don't want to wear a mask, you don't have to, but you can't do it here. Yeah. So know that you have those kinds of um, backups, you know, and protections when you do decide to... Um, make your make your stands and i love that mask that you had that said i'm smiling you yeah know, it's something like i'm smiling those things are, are clever and they're like icebreakers as yeah. well but um ladies you do want to go down there and visit that store exactly. thank you especially, so much especially uj marie yeah so um we, we're going to just move a little bit back to um katie for a moment because i just want to give you a chance to talk about um let me see. You talked about the support that you're giving um, businesses um, in in the areas. I just want to know: Did you lose um, businesses in in the area in the commons due to the closures and the slowing down of of, of things? Um, so we're really fortunate in Mashpee um, to have a lot of really strong merchant communities, not just Mashpee Commons, but South Cape Village and Deer Crossing. There's a strong community on Route 151 that support each other. Um, we see um, one business move out of Mashpee, but not close. We saw one close um, completely unrelated to COVID. Um, and so we saw a very normal amount of movement in the business landscape here in Mashpee. I know that other communities were hit differently. Mm -hmm. um, I, I understand that urban centers were much more dramatically impacted um, on a merchant standpoint, on a storefront standpoint. What we saw more is that our existing businesses expanded into um, online realms, right? or like Bad Martha um, doing curbside, right? Um, being given permission from the, from the Commonwealth to allow people to um, transport their alcoholic beverages in a way that they weren't allowed to before. Um, so we were really, really fortunate here um, on most of Cape Cod and certainly in Mashpee that we have a really, really strong merchant community. Um, and we have a really great support from our, from our town leaders as well. It's a small town. Uh, we get into the same old messy town politics as everyone else, but in the at the end of the day, our board of health and our town manager went the extra mile to make sure that our businesses had the accommodations that they needed, mm -hmm. um, which I'm so grateful for because I was not in a position to provide that myself, but I was really grateful to see outdoor dining expanding um, and to stay expanded now, I think through November, maybe Ralph can can qualify that. I just read that this morning. So yeah, the um, governor has, um, he had certain areas where he's extending the mm -hmm. state of emergency. One of them was the outdoor dining mm -hmm. and the special permitting that um, goes with yeah. that. So that's and good I, news. Yeah. And I think that affects towns like Chatham and like Hyannis and Falmouth, that their main street is their main focus for their restaurants, where they're having to exclude certain parking spaces or to make special accommodations in places where you'd usually have 
um, waste management or pedestrians. Um, so that's great news for us. Um, if I can, I wanted to touch, um, there was so much shared here that I don't know how an hour is ever enough for these conversations, Marie. Yeah, yeah. Um, even the ones that I watch on YouTube, I'm like desperate for, for, for more. Oh, it's wild. Yeah. That's why um, we share our contact information. Yeah, so good. Anyone who wants to in the chats and we make yeah. it available, you know, okay. Yeah. So go ahead, Katie. Um, but I just wanted to say, I, the, the question that this whole conversation is posed on, are we ready? Um, I want to just bring it back to 16 months ago. No one was ready. Literally no one was ready. Um, no one in their business plan, no insurance company had global pandemic. Um, the only company I know of that was ready was the was HEB in Texas. I have not heard any other stories of any other corporation prepared for a public health emergency of this scale. Um, and equally, we're now flipping that coin over, right? No one is fully prepared for normal, right? We have all gotten a little extra weird, right? We have all had to change our daily practices. The number of times I go into my house has grown because I'm like, I forgot my phone, I forgot my keys, I forgot my mask, right? So <laughs> we're, we have all, changed. However, um, what I really believe, at least that I can speak to in my community, so Upper Cape, and then I also, like I shared before we started the recording, I work one day a week on Main Street in Chatham at a retail store, um, is that the, the challenges are different, but they're not necessarily a lot more. They're just different, right? Um, so no, we're not ready. There's no way we can be ready, um, but we'll figure it out like we have for the past 16 months for mm -hmm. sure, right? Mm -hmm. I'm really confident in that. I've seen a lot of resilience. I've seen mm -hmm. a lot of um, pivoting, adapting, and I've seen the successfully minded business people, the people that are optimistic, the mm -hmm. people that are progressive in terms of how they think about the future, you know, and goal set appropriately, be mm -hmm. really successful despite all of these challenges. And I think they'll continue to be. Just like the minimum wage increase has become a debate for small businesses. Um, and I have conversations about this every single day. Um, and actually, I think Jessica kind of lent towards this, right? If you're a good leader, you're going to find good followers right? And you're going to lead the path for people to make the same, the same great changes for small business. So I just wanted to share that because I think that's really, really, it's really easy to get scared and nervous and confused and pessimistic. Mm -hmm. But I really do see a, a shimmer of optimism when we start to actually talk to each other mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. um, I get the fortune of talking to hundreds of people um, in the business community and hearing their fears, but also hearing the excitement too mm -hmm. a little mm -hmm. bit it's it's they're all they're all together yeah so I just wanted to share that there is there is a path forward we don't know what the heck it is we can't see around the bend right but mm -hmm. um there's people out there wearing the right foot gear to get it to get to the other side of the path I don't know how else to analogize that but everyone's shaking sure. their heads so I think they got it I, I, I get that <laughs> you know I I, yeah. I think that is it, it's 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 very true and if we sometimes would tamp down the rhetoric you know what I mean yeah. and sometimes we tend to go for the othering the rhetoric and we you know we go hard after that and it's our it's our default mechanism, right? To be Absolutely. pessimistic and go, and instead of being be solution minded and working together, that's mm -hmm. where we shine, right? Yeah. And as Americans, um, you know, we, we, we call ourselves number one and we want to be number one. And, and that's what I think, you know, just like in this time of racial, you know, unrest and things that are coming to light, you know, where we are weak, those are the things that really were amplified right yeah. now, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and to speak to that on another note, you're absolutely right, because part of our, a huge part of our problem with hiring right now, especially on Cape Cod, is that we have closed our borders. The entire world has. There sure. are uh, 540,000 uh, visa holders 
for seasonal employment that are not being let into the country right now because our embassies are shut. Our embassies are closed around the world to the public, yes. so they can't yes. get access. Our borders are literally shut. So exactly what you're saying, Marie, if we close ourselves off, we struggle. Yes, but you yeah. know, those cries of immigrants taking our jobs, they're taking our jobs. We need them. <laughs> Now we see, because I, I yes. hold J1 students for many years. Yeah, I know you do. They yeah. get up without thought and hesitation and mm -hmm. go ride their bikes in the dark, in the dead of night, through rain, sleet, snow and hail. They ride their bikes and they yeah. go and work all day and they mm -hmm. come home and plop in the bed and do it again. And, you know, for short money and they never complain. And then we have people who say, the immigrants are taking our jobs and now they can't come here. Mm -hmm. And we're saying the lazy Americans aren't working. See, we spend more time othering each mm -hmm. other, right? And putting yep. each other down mm -hmm. and, instead of empathizing and getting the work done. When in, in fact, we have everything we need right here to do the work, right? If we extend our hands to our neighbors and our brothers and our sisters and, and lock arms and, and, and get the work done, right? So Ralph, we, we see it in, in your workplace. I, I had the, the fortune of, of needing to deliver something to him at his workplace today and he was convening a staff meeting. And I commented, there's a lot of cars here, but I know what hospitality means to you, Ralph, right? And, yeah. and having um, that customer service experience with you to, to, um, to your customer. So what having a, a, a younger workforce because you know people aren't returning to work or um, you know college students at home yet, how, how are you handling um, that aspect? you know that getting that same customer service feeling to your to your clientele, Without yeah. So, yeah, that's a great, great, great question. Um, this will be the second season where we're really getting a very inexperienced hospitality driven um, uh, workforce. So a lot of these kids and young adults are coming out of college and high school and don't have plans or their school are remote and they're not going off somewhere or you know, they graduate with a degree in engineering, but there is no job. So you're getting a lot of transient hospitality workers who come in and aren't ready for service. So this is my second um, time where we hold a staff meeting and I really just have to share and teach them about hospitality. And I say, you know, every position here is an action uh, service oriented job. So to wait, you are waiting on someone to serve, you are serving someone to tend bar, you are tending to someone. So you have to really kind of dial that into this, this, this generation of uh, people coming into the hospitality. And that's what's one of the biggest challenges I'm finding um, with the workforce right now. And it touches upon, like you were saying, with all the, the people that have visas who are not allowed and they are more service oriented and appreciative of the work and do the work. You know, this, this, this workforce, while they're gracious to have a job, they come in as if they should be the CEO or they come in with an entitled, um, you know, attitude. And then also just a, you know, a bare minimum attitude. And it's not, you know, it's not, it's, it's not hard work at Bad Martha, definitely. It's a brewery, we, you know, very limited things, but it's repetitive work. It's a constant work. It's a new beacon in the town and it's very busy. So we, we have long days, long hours. And I mean, after three, four hours, these people are like, oh, can I have a break? You know, and it's like, you know, it's, it's just in service industry, we don't get breaks, you know, that's, that's really unheard of, you know, to even have a break, you know, you're lucky if you can put a morsel in your body after a 12 hour shift, if you're working a double, you know? So um, it's just a new crop, but I think like we're all pivoting and I think it's a great opportunity for businesses to really look at how to um, talk to their workers and create these channels of uh, hospitality and um, different ways of, you know, just bringing new people into the industry and, um, and everything. And we're doing great incentives at Bad Martha, you know, we're trying to get the worker to really commit. So we're 
um, for every 20 hours that they put in, we're giving them a differential in their pay up to $24 an hour. So dishwashers are making $24 an hour, which is so unheard of, um, but it's just, it's what you have to do now. I mean, it's very competitive here on Cape Cod. We, you know, we can't even touch on the housing crisis that's really decimating the hospitality industry um, workforce here, but it's just, I mean, there's just so much, um, you know, cutthroat within the businesses themselves of just trying to get workers, you know, and people are sending out other people to scout restaurant uh, staff and say, come work for me, we'll pay you $2 more. And, you know, so it's, it's just a challenge. So you have to be able to uh, shift and, and migrate as well. And I think that, I think at the end of the day, it's going to lend itself to a better uh, pay scale for restaurant workers. One of the things that um, the increase in pay to the hospitality industry is doing is um, making it hard for the, the educated master's level um, employee who is searching for work to get that pay raise because now you're paying high school students, you know, $20 an hour to, to serve up donuts. And then you have people with master's levels looking for jobs and, and, and getting their compensation. One of the opportunities we have here is um, to, to hire um, others, kind, um, other people who have been left out of the workforce, um, like people with disabilities, diverse abilities. I, I see when we walk into stores, they're, they're, be, they're acting as greeters, they're, they're wiping carriages, they're bringing carriages back. And I'm talking about people with um, like developmental delays and things like that. And that excites me, you know, um, being a mother of, of a child with a, a developmental delay. Um, and they're doing such wonderful work out there. And so in this opportunity for the over 55 um, employee as well, who has in between that retirement age, who wants to re-enter the workforce, who's been pushed out. Um, and there's things that people can do um, in that area as well, you know, and, and also, um, people of color. So Jessica, I just want to give you another moment to speak. And I wanted you to talk about those numbers and that we were talking briefly about that herd immunity number. I know that as a state where just under 40%, I mean, excuse me, under 50%, and we're saying we're at 50, so we're opening up, but we're, 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 we're just under 50% in there in, in, um, President Biden is talking about being at 70% vaccination rate by um, July 4th. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we're going to get there. They said that the vaccination rate has slowed now. They're giving out everything from cheeseburgers and fries to um, tickets to the lottery to... Dunkin', Dunkin Donuts are giving vaccinations. Like that's, that's the level, that's where we're, we're at. You can get your vaccine at Dunkin' Donuts. No, oh, I didn't hear that. But <laughs> it I was mean, on the, it was on the news Can you do today. a dry, is it drive up? It is <laughs> Thank yeah. goodness, no. And like I said, it, it's just really indicative of where we're at as a country and the division. I, I'm looking at these numbers, you know, because there are people yeah. who no matter what, will not get vaccinated. They're like, I'm not doing that. I don't know what you're putting in my body. You're microchipping me. You yeah. know, they have every kind of theory in the world. Um, my kids aren't going back to school, you know. So I just want you to talk to that a little bit, Jessica. Okay, well, there's a lot there. And um, so there's there's two, two groups of people who aren't getting vaccinated, right? There are the vaccine hesitant who, you know, tend to be, people in more marginalized communities who have distrust around the healthcare system. And that is um, either they have distrust or they have lack of access or they have lack of um, resources to actually distribute or um, have access to the vaccine. Then you have the, the group that, you know, we're calling vaccine resistant who are, you know, have kind of bought into some of these conspiracy theories that, you know, Bill Gates has put microchips and we're all gonna, you know, be cyborgs by the time it's done and it's altering your DNA. And, you know, none of those are true. If anybody is listening to this, none of those are true. Vaccines are safe. <laughs> um, 
and and this idea of herd immunity, we don't yet know really what percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated to achieve herd immunity. For some diseases that are less infectious, that that threshold can be like 80%. For highly infectious diseases such as measles, that threshold is more like 95%. And that's, you know, the, the more of these uh, strains and very uh, mutations, variants of the COVID-19 uh, emerge that are more infectious, that are, you know, easy, more easily spread and, and spreading unchecked in, in many parts of the world right now. If you're watching the numbers in India, it's, it's just horrifying to see what's happening globally. We don't know what that number is. We, you know, the, the best guess right now, the experts, I, most of my consulting is in the healthcare field. So I'm listening to these conversations every day mm -hmm. is that we, we're gonna have to hit close to 95% to really have herd immunity. And there's no way Logistically today, there is no way we can hit 95%, even, even within this country, let alone the globe, because we can't vaccinate children under 12. And children under 12 represent more than 5% of the global population. So never mind the people who can't get vaccinated, people who are severely immunocompromised, people who are, who are um, major organ transplant recipients. You know, there are a lot of people who cannot receive the vaccine and that's the reason to go for herd immunity, right? Is to protect the people who can't be vaccinated. Um, so it's, it's, it's really until knowing then that we logistically can't get to herd immunity, all of us have to really think about then how do we, how do we take care of the people around us? As you know, business leaders, how do we take care of the people in our charge? Right, because as leaders, our job is not to be in charge. Our job is to take care of those in our charge, and to say, you know, is is the right answer to make say everybody has to wear a mask? Is the right answer to say, you know, all of our employees have to wear a mask, and you know, we're not going to deal with this with the customers. You will just sanitize everything, sort of what we were doing in those first few months of the pandemic. Um, Ralph talked a little bit about that, you know, having sanitizing everything, every second of every day. Um, I, it, I think that unfortunately, because this is still, you know, we have 16 months with this disease now, right? But it's still so much we don't know mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, can, you know, truly can people who are vaccinated continue to carry the disease and spread it to unvaccinated people? We think not. Are we 100% sure about that? No. You know, and there's the number of breakthrough infections, right? People who have been vaccinated, but also then subsequently are infected with COVID-19. Um, the most high profile being half the New York Yankees. Um, you know, they're going to have fewer symptoms and they're going to think that they're immune, that they're vaccinated. So they're not going to attribute those symptoms to COVID-19. But of course, if they have an active COVID-19 infection, even if they have been vaccinated, they are infectious and can spread it. And so there's so many variables. And I just urge everyone to think, protect each other, you know, be kind and protect each other. If, you know, somebody's not wearing a mask and, and you think they should be, just stay away from them. You know, if somebody is wearing a mask and you think they shouldn't be, stay away from them. You know, just let people, you know, and, and for every business owner, you know, think this through. If your space is 650 square feet, which is what I, I think I heard Carrie say for, for theirs, maybe that's, you know, that's a very different thing than requiring a mask at Bad Martha's, which, you know, rep Bad Martha, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that that has all this or knock about or any of the other places on the Cape that have these beautifully, you know, set up well distanced outdoor spaces that that the employees can feel safe and the staff can, you know, the, the visitors can feel safe. And, you know, every, every business is going to have to look at that individually. And you, there's guidance out there, you know, OSHA is going to be coming out with with standards that will hopefully guide some stuff beyond just if you're in healthcare and public transit, you should be wearing masks. 
Mm -hmm. um, and there's people who are, you know, reach out to the board of health and ask, you know, what they're recommending. Reach out to your chambers of commerce who have already talked to the boards of health to find out what the recommendations are. Reach out to SCORE and, you know, and say, help me figure this out. Um, that's honestly, that's been a fair amount of the, the consulting that I've been doing, even within the healthcare field as outpatient um, practices have reopened in-person visits and how do we do this safely and how many patients can we see and how do we have a flow that, you know, anybody we think is potentially infectious goes one way and everybody else goes another way. And, you know, that's a little more complicated than the average business owner, you know, thankfully, most people don't have to think about that, but you do still have to think about what would I do, you know, how would I feel if my, my staff died because they were infected at work? A, a very close friend of mine was infected at work and, and passed away within three weeks of, you know, young, healthy guy. After, you know, just, just a, not that long ago. You know, so had gotten all the way through the pandemic and, you know, a coworker was infected, didn't realize it, came to work, infected multiple other people. And so these are, these are people's lives we're talking about. We, we have to remember that, like, there is no profit that's worth a life. You know, there's no profit that's worth a life. So that's my soapbox. Thank you. I just want to take a moment and read a statement by, um, the um, executive director of the sandwich chamber. She sent me a statement to be read because she has multiple things going on today and she wanted to be here really bad, but she couldn't be. Her name's Denise Devers. And then I just wanna open it up um, for just a moment for any questions before we close out, okay? So this says the sandwich chamber of commerce is already seeing a lot of visitors stopping by our welcome center. Our businesses are open and have been ready for our visitors for quite some time. Come on in and we will help you navigate your journey and let you use our restrooms. The challenges are the same as everywhere on the Cape and beyond. Our businesses have a staffing shortage. We have been unable to bring our J1 and H2B visa holders to our region as we have in the past due to COVID issues. This has hurt us tremendously. Our businesses are preserving, excuse me, persevering and doing the best they can. We continue to see signs and ask for patience and kindness as we move towards our new normal. Thank you, Denise, for sending that in. At this time, I just wanna ask if there's any questions. Kim, I see your hand raised, thank you. Can you unmute yourself? Um, are you saying me, Kim, or is there another Kim? Nope, it's you. Oh, gosh, I, I didn't think I had a hand raised, but um, oh, yeah. There's, there's a hand on your thing, maybe it's my hand. Oh, it's my hand thing. That's okay. Okay. But yeah, <laughs> I would love to hear a little more from, um, Ralph, in terms of I uh, just like your blog around the um, my daddy wears an apron just sounds really, really fun. And I think I didn't catch like how starting that blog kind of morphed into these other things for you. I mean, you're uh, clearly such a skilled entrepreneur. Like how what was that transition like there? Yeah. So, I mean, my, like I said, my daddy wears an apron. It's just my journey with my children. So I have a nine and a 10 year old a boy and a girl, Jackson and Emma. And I just started writing, you know, I think it was a time where um, being a stay at home dad, there was so much isolation around parenting as a, as a male. And, you know, at the time my wife was working and um, it was just, you know, so I used Facebook and I used that outlet to just share the stories and we cooked, you know, we cooked, we gardened, we, we did um, activities and, you know, all the early intervention programs and everything. And I just kind of shared the stories of that. And, um, and still to this day, you know, they're still cooking with me. There's still different challenges and different things as they grow. So I started doing that. And then um, when the pandemic hit, um, I started just, you know, sharing 
uh, some of those old stories with parents who are now faced with being stay at home during the pandemic. So a lot of parents don't get that opportunity. It's a it's a very you know nice luxury if you can stay home with your children. And you know my family always said we don't send our children out to daycares and things until they can talk. So that was important to you know both of us to stay home. And I had the opportunity um, because in twenty. 10 the hospitality industry was hit again with a recession and i got laid off so when i was having my second child it kind of just made sense and i could collect unemployment and be home with the children so um with that i just kind of started sharing some of those old stories with these parents who were home and you know i told them activities and um next thing you know uh and i shared them on facebook i got a call from the kdc and they asked, oh, would you love to do something for our, you know, young people? And um, and I started that. And it was, you know, like I said, such a whirlwind of fun. It was, we celebrated our year anniversary a couple of weeks ago, and we had a big celebration. And you could see the growth of culinary ability just in those students from where we started a year ago to where they're now. And we just have a great time. And, um, and it's kind of just morphed into, you know, fathers, you know, taking down those barriers of such toxic masculinity and all those things and just, you know, cooking and sharing and, and being with your child and, um, and, you know, fast forward now you see it everywhere, you know, I think, you know, over the last 10 years, there's been such an explosion and a, and a balance with dads and parents and, you know, everything that, you know, anyone has opportunity to parent and, 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 um, raise their children and, you know, and now with this remote working, it just is changing the dynamics, so. Thank you. That's a pretty fun story. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, does anyone else have anything that they want to ask our panelists before we sign off and, and get ready for the big day on Saturday? I just wish everyone well, and I hope that everyone does what's best for them as we navigate this uh, new normal. And that um, I love how Katie's. Uh, said we came out, we're kind of weird. <laughs> we came out kind of weird. Weird and in yoga pants, right? Yeah, right. so, um, <laughs> you know, Cape Cod, they always kind of look like they had yoga pants on anyway. So it's like no big change, but um, yeah. So there's a lot of great things. Marie, do you want to mention uh, Ray Sam and Yay? I have to unmute there. Okay. Um, yeah, that's um, something that um, uh, we had a little snafu in terms of our approval process, but I think uh, as of, no, as today, I think we are going to be able to pull it off. And um, okay. so we're planning, uh, for those of you that don't know, um, Race Amity Day was, um, was, uh, has actually been in operation in Massachusetts, um, particularly in the last eight years or so. And uh, we've never actually had a celebration as such um, in this community in Mashpee, although it has been done um, in, many, in many communities, but there's a move to try to get it done um, everywhere. And so it's the second um, Sunday of June is when it is. So, uh, and that's across the state. And um, so it would be June uh, 13th. So we're planning something at the community park um, at this point. Um, and um, from one to three in the afternoon as we were going with this. Um, so it'll, it'll, it's going to be a, a first time <laughs> venture <laughs> and we'll see how, how we do and try to get the community involved. And um, so that's, that's where we are now and kind of the, the, um, you know, initial stages, but we have, it, it came really, I, I'm the chair of the inclusion and diversity committee for the town, but the interesting thing is this initiative didn't come from us. It came from people in the community that have made, uh, who in the Baha'i uh, community and also um, some people that have moved in um, that have done that in other towns. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to get together people beyond our committee that really want to make this happen. So we'll see how it goes. Good, thank you. So, um, it, does it anyone else? Because I'm going to Juneteenth stand out the Unifer, Unitarian Church. Um, I, okay, so you can read the chats. It just went off. So yeah, I, uh, yeah. There's a new committee starting in Sandwich, and um, they've contacted me, and they're they're doing something in Sandwich. 
on the, uh, for Juneteenth, um, the day before us. So that would be what uh, the 12th on a Saturday at one of the school grounds. And so they're planning something for Juneteenth and Woods Hole adversary, um, uh, advers their, their committee um, is, um, is, is also have a lot going on in their planning. Okay, great. So maybe we'll talk about Juneteenth in our next show. So yeah. I just want to thank you all for coming and hanging in there on this beautiful Wednesday. I know it's, um, it, you know, it's a difficult day where everything is moving and shifting and opening back up and people have things to do. But I, I just thank you for joining us and listening in. And this is recorded. So you'll be able to look back and 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 get some information out of the chats if you if you need some things. Um, what is this looking to cook? Okay, and, and Ralph has some recorded cooking demonstrations as well. So I just like to thank our panelists. I'd like to thank Katie um, from the um, Mashpee Chamber of Commerce. And we are just so proud of you. And we know that you're going to do a wonderful job there and we support you. And I will try to be at um, some of the, um, you know, events going on. You have after hours and things that are always a great time. Here's um, some pictures, her ribbon cutting up there in the corner. You can see where they moved into their new offices oh, yeah. in Mashpee, right at where Cape Space Building, you know, mm -hmm. they're wearing masks now. I'm not too sure what they'll be wearing next week. <laughs> anyway, and there's um, the store, Refashion in Chatham, right, and the two partners. So we, we're just glad. Uh, we'd like to thank Carrie Passell and um, and her partner from Refashion um, Chatham and also Ralph uh, Jason Younger from Bad Mothers Farmers Brewery in East Falmouth. Um, do visit them if you get a, a chance um, sometime this summer. And we'd like to thank our guest, Jessica. Where's Jessica? Let's see, Ellis Wilson. We just thank you um, for joining us and just being a, a great voice and, um, and, and just, a, I call you an advocate for, you know, the underserved because you really speak powerfully for people. And I just appreciate you always um, on this show, you know, so thank you so much. And I thank you for the guests that, that visit um, us and, and tune in week after week after week. So, we thank you and thank you, Karen. Karen Ryan's up there in the corner from Social Techies. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so we didn't thank our sponsors today. And I'd like to thank um, the Department of Developmental Services and Kennedy Donovan Center and Social Techie um, for sponsoring the show as well as Simply Black and White Catering and Events. And I thank you. And have a good evening, guys. Hi, Beth. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thanks, Kim, all the way from New Hampshire. Thank you so much. Raquel, thank you. Jay Marie, thank you. Heather, thank you. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank Never you, much. Marie. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank, thank you. you Thanks, Ralph. Thank, thank you. you. This time. was great. Yep. Yes, it was. Thank you, Mary Jane. Yep. Good to see everybody. Thank you.